Welcome to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green. And joining me this week, as always, is science expert, Sari Riley. Hello. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hello. This is our first recording after after uh, returning from the break. That's not going to seem like it to you, but we do things no. all out of order here on SciShow yep. Tangents. So we 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 recognize that we're a little rusty. So we spent the first 10 minutes just talking. One of the things we talked about was the fact that Sam, I think, thought that Panic at the Disco was a Panic at the Disco song. Is that right? <laughs> I don't <laughs> I actually didn't. I didn't think that until you said that it maybe was, and then I looked it up, and it wasn't. Because it does sound like they would have a song called that. I think I was the one who said it, to be fair, well, and to like, what, what lampoon said, myself. Is this a good Weird Al song, Panic in the Discord? Which it would be it if Panic at the Disco were a song, oh, which unfortunately oh, okay. it's not. Sometimes Weird Al does those mash ups of a bunch of songs, you know? He does like his polka thing. So his polka uh-huh. song for a new album, Weird Al, hit me up if you're listening. I'll help you write it. Uh-huh. Is yeah. Panic in the Discord. And it's all Panic at the Disco songs about, yes. uh, about the internet or something, I guess. Oh, so he, he polkas fandoms. and yeah. and he, he, he actually does a parody in the polka, which he doesn't usually do. Yeah, which do. he doesn't usually do. I love that. I love that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's like a five-minute song that's just... I could not name for you a Panic at the Disco song. I, I'm going to lose uh, fans with that have, sentence. Do they do high, high Hopes? Is that them? What I'm thinking is, when I was a young man, my father no. took that's me band, into the city. That's not Panic at the Disco? No. I don't, that's, I don't actually know. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the Black Parade. That's bands it, called it, Welcome ever, to the Black Parade. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone who's our age is yelling right now. Yeah. Because yeah, they are. Is... They're yelling at. They're yelling. It's, it's that's, that's my, my chemical, chemical romance. My chemical that romance. That one. Yep. Uh, of yeah. course. I apologize. Now I really will lose fans. <laughs> I have no yeah. idea how related those two bands are. I. They seem like they'd be best friends or worst enemies. I don't know which one. Though. Just, just remember, I'm 42 years old. I listened to <laughs> very cool music <laughs> before my chemical romance existed, but not since. <laughs> But I do think it would be cool if every band had to write and perform a song that was their name. They Might Be Giants have a song called They Might Be Giants. So my favorite yeah. band fulfills this rule. It's just called They Might Be Giants, and the lyrics are largely They Might Be Giants over and over again. That's yeah. fine. Yeah, even if a yeah. band's um, theme song, as it were, yeah. is just them singing the name of their band over and over and over again, I would yeah. accept that as a as a valid mm-hmm. entry into it. The better ones will be like a great TV show theme song where there's some backstory. You get a little bit about each of the members. Maybe you, you get the some vibe of the, of the band. Yeah. Of the, some history. Just packed into a 30 second jingle that really is right. an Catch earworm. Me up. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know what's going on, on here. what I missed on this band. Yeah. If I was showing up to this concert and I yeah. knew nothing. I desperately need that. Apparently... For My Chemical Romance and Panic at the Disco. It I need really them helpful. to have written that song. Sarah, have you heard the Monkees theme song? The hey, no, hey, I have not. Monkeys? It's literally what you just described. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, we're the Monkees. People say we monkey around. I'm an around. innovator. That's all you need to yeah. know. But we're that's too busy to singing know. to bring anybody down. Yeah. That's, that's nice the vibe, guys. right? We're just mm-hmm. having a good time exactly. singing. We would never be mean. <laughs> 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 that's like a pretty good vibe to go into as yeah. a band. Uh huh. We're not mean. We like to sing. Go. Yeah. I know so much about the monkeys now, never having heard a single one of their songs. And I bet mm. I would know even more if I actually listened to it because then I know <laughs> what their music sounds like. Yeah. So, yeah. I think this is our new podcast where we come up with theme songs for oh, all the bands. Oh, I like that. We write. Tuna will write the, the yeah. music. Oh, to yeah. It Just put it all on Tuna. <laughs> <laughs> a full song. In the style well, of every different musician that's ever existed. I want to know, uh-huh. if, so hit us up on Twitter where I, I will get secondhand information from someone <laughs> so um, pass it over. with any b- other bands that have written their own theme songs. I think that if you're My Chemical Romance, it's a little bit too, like you're trying to be very, you're trying to be pretty cool. And it's not uh-huh. very cool to be like, My Chemical Romance, <laughs> we're just a couple of bros, man. And just like going to, and then like naming each of the bros. <laughs> I think that was really I think that'd cool. be great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's look at who the bros in My Chemical Romance are. 
<laughs> Their names all rhyme so perfectly. Come on, guys. They do. <laughs> there's yeah. Gerard Way. There's Ray Toro. Ray rhymes with Way. And then there's Frankie Arrow, which rhymes with Toro. And there's Mikey Way, which rhymes with Way and Ray. You're just leaving it's so money good. on the table, They're, folks. It Come writes on. itself. <laughs> the theme song writes itself. Come and Hank on. already wrote the first Gerard, line. this is unacceptable that you haven't <laughs> done this yet. <laughs> I know Gerard listens to the podcast because he is a huge dork uh, from everything I've ever <laughs> read or heard about him. Uh, so I I assume that he's going to take our advice. Every week on SciShow Tangents, we get together to try to one-up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts while also trying to, and failing to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for glory and for Hank Bucks, and I'll be awarding those as we play, and one of them at the end of the episode will be crowned the winner. But first, as always, we're going to introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem. This week is going to be from Sari. We're my chemical romance. (laughs) (laughs) I need some help. And here's the thing. What's the word for a sort of biological string? It's outside, not (laughs) hidden within the gut and tends to stick out behind the butt. Some are twisty and long and free to wrap round some grass or the branch of a tree. Some are strong and stout and flat to paddle in water or compress a mud mat. Some are fluffy and point up towards the sky. Others hang down unless they're spotting a fly. It's not an arm or leg or wing or hoof. It's on creatures that honk and on critters that woof. (laughs) And lots of things don't have one at all, tucked away with the spine, vestigial and small, or it never evolved. Their body just ends in a hard or soft casing that doesn't extend. It's really bad luck that my brain chose to fail at recalling the name of this appendage that trails behind quails and whales and horses and dales. Ah, well, let's see what this podcast entails. Wow. (laughs) That was like the platonic idea of a science poem. That was so good. Yeah. (laughs) The topic of the day is tales, which I predict is going to be undefinable. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's gonna be a, a hairy one for sure because <laughs> yeah. there's a, there's all kinds of things that like sometimes a tail is just made out of feathers sometimes a tail is made out of chitin or like a like a scorpion has a tail but mm-hmm. like is, does that count even it must right but that's a totally different sort of like biological thing than like the extension of the vertebra uh like the extension right. of the vertebral column that is is like a mammal tail or a vertebrate tail that's the the divide and that's where it gets finicky is Mm -hmm. how precise do you want to be with your language when you're talking about tail and for what purpose are you are you saying the word tail if you just mean the the thing thing. behind the animal Mm -hmm. the tail will do probably for so many different things the whether it's feathers or the the back part of an insect kind of like how we use butt for the butt fact it's just like it's the it's the bad part. You know, it's a butt. It's, it's, it's the sticky outy part. It's, it's the tail. It's anything that's close to b- butt like. So is it kind of sticky outy behind the back end of an animal? It's a tail. It, it, is a, does a snake have yeah. a tail? It kind of, it's there. Snake it, has oh, a snake, it's yeah, sticky outy. It definitely has a tail. It, like has yeah. a, it has like a part of the body where the digestive tract ends, and then there's like just, it's, then it's just muscle and bone. Like it doesn't anything like, post like you butthole, definitely don't have right? intestines in your tail, right? But I guess a worm does is a worm just oh. one tail. Where's a, t- a worm's butt? Is it at the other? It's so right at the end. end. Yeah. So I wouldn't a, think that he'd have as a tail. we as I, I believe we have a, said on the podcast before. Worms are just an just intestine. A digestive tract. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So I don't think worms have a tail. I think it has to be after your butt to be a tail post butt. Well, so I don't think insects have scorpion. butts or tails. Yeah, right. and then then a scorpion tail, its anus is at the end of its little it is little oh. bit. Yeah, I so technically they don't I, have a tail. I would have assumed it was like a snake. Yeah, yeah, where there'd no. be a pooper and then the the tail would go out, but it poops out of its no, stinger and pooper. Do they poop on their heads or do yeah. they point it behind them? <laughs> no, they can point that thing wherever they want. They sometimes probably poop on their heads when they want to. Oh shoot! Yeah, they they, they can do it. Poop. Wouldn't you do it sometimes <laughs> if you could? No, <laughs> just once to see if you could what it felt like. <laughs> <laughs> All um, right, we'll do a we'll do a quick poll of the audience. <laughs> if you had head? a tail that could <laughs> reach your head, would you poop directly onto your head just once? As a baby, I would have. As a kid, 
Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like when I had no control and I rolled around in mud for fun, I would yeah. absolutely poop on myself just yeah. once. Oh my oh. God. It would be, there'd be a name for it. It'd be like, oh, <laughs> little yep. Jimmy had his first head turd. Yeah. <laughs> first and only, I hope. Yeah. So I'm satisfied that we're not even going to get close to the bottom of this one. No, I can try a little bit harder <laughs> to get a little bit okay. a- away from the bottom. If you want to do it in terms of bone and skin and muscle, then okay. the we have different types of vertebra in our spine. Oh. Like, for example, the cervical vertebrae are in your neck. And then the thoracic vertebrae anchor your rig- rib cage. The lumbar vertebrae mm. are in your abdomen. The sacral vertebrae are oh. with your pelvis. Mm. And then the caudal, C-A-U-D-A-L vertebrae are the tail vertebrae. Mm. Um, and so oh. in humans the and other tailless primates, they are called the coccygeal vertebrae. They are fused into the coccyx, which is your tailbone. But in other, like in a cat or a dog or a lizard, then the caudal vertebrae are what make up the interior of the tail. Um, And so if you want to dive in zoologically and try a little harder to define tail, then it includes the the caudal vertebrae and then some sort of muscle skin tissue wrapped around the outside. Mm -hmm. And by that very narrow definition, then you need to have a spine. So with vertebrates, at least we can kind of say, do we know where the word tail came from? As far as I can tell, and as far as the Oxford English Dictionary can tell, uh, it just came from hindmost part of an animal. Like it, it meant that. Oh, okay. All the way back to old English. So it's just and a word for old butt. Germanic. Yeah, but but like a hairy butt, kind of. Oh. So mm. the the primary sense seems to be in like tuft of hair, as opposed to like the hairless tail of a like a scorpion or a bee or mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but where that etymology shifted is kind of mushy. And another word, in addition to tail, that they used for tail as like the tail end of something was start, which I thought was really yeah, interesting. Wait a minute. Oh, okay. So the tail of an animal was called the start. So you're just like, ah, oh, the animal started there. <laughs> uh, and that little ropey thing is the tail of an animal. Yeah, that's very confusing. Yeah. That's not, mm-hmm. that doesn't seem right at all. The opposite of what yeah. they are supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel like I start up at the top, but I don't know. Where do I start? Anyway, I think this might be time for us to do the game. Do you guys want to do the game? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. We're going <laughs> <playing. laughs> to be playing a game called Where's the Lie? Uh, in this game, I'm going to be describing to you a few, in a few sentences, something kind of sciencey, uh, some kind of sciencey story thing. And uh, it will be true. Except for one thing, and it's up to you to figure out what the untrue part of my science story is. It's tricky. It's like you're going to well actually me, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, You'll be mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, that's close, but not quite. So, round number one. We're going to start with the fat-tailed dwarf lemur of Madagascar. And it depends on its fat da- tail as a way to survive its hibernation periods. The lemur usually weighs about 4 to 10 ounces, but to prepare for torpor, its hibernation, the lemur will eat fruits and nectar to double its weight. And roughly 60% of its total body weight uh, during this phase will be in the lemur's tail, providing a fat store to keep it alive as, as it rests in tree holes or in underground burrows. What was the lie? The the 60%. I bet it's more than 60% of its body weight. You are right right that it is that part of the fact. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But you should have shut up there, Uh, but I'll give it to you. Uh, So can I get a swoop in? (laughs) It's in fact 40. Actually, uh, it's less than 60% (laughs) of its body weight. (laughs) That is correct. No, Sam gets it. Um, so the tail ends up being 40% of the total uh, of the lemur's total body weight. 60% will be a lot more than 60% will be a heck of a lot, but who knows? Uh, doesn't Animals even sound really very weird. impressive anymore. <laughs> that seems like a lot. <laughs> How fat is that tail? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not that fat. Mm-hmm. Come on, fat-tailed lemur. I've seen fatter <laughs> tails. So uh, Madagascar doesn't get very cold, so you'd think maybe they wouldn't need to have hibernations, but droughts can drive a lack of food that requires animals to conserve energy, and dwarf lemurs are the only primates on Madagascar known to deal with this by hibernating, and they rely on their tails 
to do that hibernation. Uh, they might breathe once every 10 minutes during this hibernation and have a heartbeat wow. of just six what? beats per minute. And it can last for up to seven months, though they will take breaks to reset their heart rate and their body temperature uh, sometimes during their little torpor period. Wow. Cool. And they're really cute, too. So round number two, in the 1970s, researchers studying a Persian gecko found that it had an oval-shaped growth on its tail with long scales coming off of it. Since then, scientists have learned that the strange growth on its tail is a spider-shaped lure meant to draw in birds and other prey. This method of attracting prey with one's tail is called caudal luring. Uh, just like Sari said, C-A-U-D-A-L, caudal. And it's found in other animals like the common death adder, which wiggles its tail around like a worm to lure in prey. What's the lie? I think that the spider-shaped decor on its tail is too (laughs) scary. Uh -uh, Because I, I, if I was a bird or a predator or something, I would like be scared of that and so maybe it looks more wormy maybe more wormy than spidery okay the lie that's not the lie sam oh okay (laughs) is the death adder thing the lie something about that does it not not, does the death adder not do that okay nothing to do with the death adder sari what do you have okay i'm still fixated on this growth uh, there were not scales coming off of it. They were like um, nodules or whatever is inside of intestines, but on the outside, <laughs> kind of like skin skin tags. <laughs> instead, so super floppy instead of hard and scaly. Oh, that's, that's terrible. No, that's not it. <laughs> uh, it's not the Persian gecko. It's some other kind of gecko. Oh God, say that. It's just very. That's very close. <laughs> not even another kind of gecko. It's just some other kind of guy, totally. Yeah, well, it's not a Persian gecko. It is, in fact, a Persian horned viper. So it's a kind of snake, ah. not a kind of lizard. Ah. Uh, but I'm not going to give that to you, Sam. So the okay. Persian horned viper in the 1970s, the growth seemed like a like an unusual thing. But they weren't sure if this viper was like a separate species. But it wasn't until 2006 that scientists were able to determine that they had actually been watching a different snake species, which they named the Iranian spider-tailed viper. So uh, uh-huh. it, it, it was none of it was true. It wasn't a Persian gecko or a Persian <laughs> viper, but we thought it was a Persian <laughs> viper for a long time. Uh-huh. Uh, and it turns out it is a separate species that has its own little tail lure. The, the researchers actually put a couple of these vipers in an enclosure with a bird. And the, when the bird was around, they would wiggle their tail to make it look like a crawling spider Ooh. and trick the bird into attacking it so that the snake could attack the bird. What a nasty oh, guy. Boy. That does make more sense than a gecko trying to do it. Because c- a gecko can't e- do anything yeah, about the bird a bird. Would just It'll be just like, get hell, eaten. hell, I'll eat you too, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Round number three. Ring-tailed lemurs live in Madagascar, and they get their name from, of course, their tails, which are decorated with 13 bands of black and white. The tails, it turns out, are useful for maintaining their home. When traveling as a group, the ring-tailed lemur will keep their tail pointed into the air as a flag that keeps everybody together. And when potential rivals enter their territory, the lemurs will use their tails to whisk dirt into their rivals' eyes. That's really cute. It's cute, but it's also <laughs> kind of da- it's kind of kind of down dastardly. It is kind of a dirty kind of kind of action. Of you can't yeah. just throw people throw dirt Sand in people's in eyes. People's face, yeah. <laughs> hmm. I have I have heard the thing about their tail leading people, mm. like like keeping them together. But maybe that's not true. So I'm going to guess that first is not true. Oh, the tail. Thing. You're wrong. You're wrong. That's real. Ah, okay. I think that they don't spray dirt at their enemies. That feels inefficient. Maybe they like their tails are really long. Maybe they like if they're prehensile, they like chuck objects at them Full or like whack effect. their enemies or or do something else to their tails. <laughs> you've got you've got it pretty much spot on. So they do not use their tails to whisk dirt into their rivals' eyes. But when a rival lemur encroaches on their territory, the male ring-tailed lemurs, what will they do to, to get them to go away? They'll just shake their tails at them. Oh, well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's enough, huh? That's apparently enough. Uh, instead, uh, it's actually to uh, throw smelly compounds into the rival's face. Oh, so okay. there's not, there's Ooh. no, uh, there's no kind of a fart attack no of some dirt. Sort. It's a bit of a fart attack. Yeah. 
Okay. The male ring-tailed lemurs have glands on their wrist that they can use to produce chemicals that vaporize in the air. And the males can use those glands to mark trees, but they also rub their wrists on their tail. And then they shake their tail to release the chemicals as a smelly message to the rest of the world. And during yes. much of the year, lemurs will use a set of chemicals that are bitter and leathery smelling to warn off mm. males. Imagine if Spider-Man couldn't shoot webs out of his wrist and instead had to like his rub it on a stink. tail. <laughs> He's got stinky, as a guy got stinky yeah. wrists. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can picture now. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't really understand why Spider-Man got his spider glands on his wrists. Instead of the butt. Instead of his uh, butt. He didn't. He has to make web shooters. He just has them on his wrist. He does not have organic web shooters. Okay? That was a great noise, Sam. <laughs> You're kind of far away <sighs> from the mic. I don't know if everybody else heard it. <laughs> I mostly just didn't want to have to say it, but... It's like you've said this to us before. Like, no. T- I'll, I'll say it again. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I was more embarrassed guys... for myself that I was about to say it. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, I thought you were embarrassed for us. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to know it, but I did know. Well, that uh, leaves us with Sam and Sari tied at one point. Next up, we're going to take a short break. Then it'll be time for the fact off. All right, everybody, welcome back. Get ready for the fact off. Our panelists have brought science facts to present in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge them and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit. But to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question. While most animal tails have cross sections made up of circular or oval segments, seahorses are unusual in that they have tails made up of square segments. These Mm -hmm. squares make their tails stiffer and stronger. How many square segments make up a seahorse's tail? 13. All right. I'm just going to throw out a number. That feels like an okay number. Mm -hmm. 20. They have. 36 segments. Sam, you get to decide who goes first. (laughs) Uh, I will go first. So kites have tails, as we know, and the purpose of those tails is to add some weight and stability to a kite to help it stay stable as they swoop and soar through the summer sky. And several species of butterfly, especially butterflies in the swallowtail family, also have tails trailing off of their wings. And you might think, like I did, that those probably help the butterflies also swoop and soar through the summer sky, similar to a kite's tail. I didn't think much more of it. And that also was apparently what scientists must have thought, because at least according to a quote I read, nobody really seemed to have done a deep dive into what butterfly wingtails did until a paper was published in May of 2022 Ooh. with some convincing evidence that they acted a little less like kite tails and a little more like lizard tails. So many lizards famously are able to drop off their tails when escaping danger, which sounds uh. not super fun, but more fun than having your head bitten off. And for that matter, some lizards have brightly colored or patterned tails to encourage predators to target their tails over more vital parts of their body. So their tails just look delicious. So based on that concept and the knowledge that butterflies also use wing coloration to draw attacks away from their main body parts, a group of scientists began to wonder if a swallowtail's tails were another part of their predator escaping toolkit. So the first thing they did was go out and catch a bunch of swallowtails. And what they found was that 47% of the swallowtails that they caught had damage to at least one of their tails. So that was a pretty promising start. Mm. Uh, The next Mm -hmm. step was to glue some real butterfly wings onto fake butterfly bodies on sticks and then wiggle those around in front of a bunch of uh, wild great tits that they caught which looked really goofy and and fun. And the birds attacked the dummy butterflies and and the scientists took a look at where they were taking chomps and they found that 73% of the chomps were out of the back wings and about 40% of those attacks were centered around the tail, which made the tail the most attacked part of the butterfly wing. And last but not least, the researchers tested how hard it was to rip different parts of a swallowtail's wings apart. And they found (laughs) that the vein that the the little tail has inside of it was the most fragile part of the wing. So it's easiest Mm. to rip off. And that all sounds like pretty good evidence to me. And there's also research that suggests that spiders might mistake certain butterfly tails uh, and wing spots for their uh, antenna and head. So they think that 
the butt is the head of the thing, and while it's not explicitly stated in the paper, a little conjecture from me, birds might similarly be making uh, that same mistake, trying to eat a butterfly's head and actually just taking a little snip off its butt because they're stupid. <laughs> so, t- Sam also has a theory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's also cool that there's really moss cool. That, have the, that moss have the tails too, but they use them for completely different reasons. They're like really? baffling... They're like baffling bat sonar. And stuff. Oh, they like make Instead the, make the signal make of the. Else. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's wild. I love that. Uh, I had never thought of it. You know, like you look at a butterfly and you don't think, what's the purpose of this beauty? You just think, ah, it's pretty. Um, but of course, they're not pretty for us. That's really cool. I love that. That's a good one, Sam. Thanks. Sarah, what do you got? So while they might not be direct extensions of the spinal cord, I had to put that Well, don't worry. Sam's, Sam's doesn't have to do it. Yeah. even <laughs> close to oh, actual call tails. tails. Though. <laughs> call tails. Um, so many bird species have really fabulous looking tail feathers called retrices that can be precisely controlled by muscles. Their tail mm-hmm. feathers can help with all sorts of things from stability and steering during flight to elaborate mating displays. And the male superb bird of paradise and Vogelkop mm-hmm. Bird of Paradise, both use their long, voluminous tail feathers for these wooing purposes. The superb species splays out its feathers to form an elongated oval, while the Vogelkop species forms a crescent shape instead, so like an oval with the bottom cut out. But what's more impressive than the shapes of their tail feathers is the color of them. Specifically, their black feathers have thick, dense, almost tree or seaweed-like barbules, which are those horizontal keratinous structures that make a feather feathery that scatter light so intensely that the inky black color approximates human-made, ultra-absorbent black materials. And according to measurements in a study published in January 2018, these super black feathers can absorb up to 99.95% of directly incident light. And from what I've found, the various carbon nanotube structures in materials science labs have achieved around a maximum of 99.96% to... Uh, a max of 99.995% absorption, which is pretty good. Uh, And even when these bird of paradise feathers were coated with a reflective metal like gold, they still remain black because of how the barbules bounce around light, which is very cool. Who did that research? Just like, like nano deposit gold on a, on bird feathers just to see what happens. Same study. Yeah. That, that January, 2018 study, they took a black feather from a different bird and black feather from this bird and then sprayed them with gold. And as with many (sighs) extreme visual adaptations, scientists think that these tail feathers are so light swallowingly black in order to highlight a couple of bright blue feather patches during their mating dance, Mm -hmm. which end up looking kind of like a haunting smiley face in a void. Mm -hmm. It's very weird. I highly recommend watching a video because it's very silly. Um, and <laughs> they don't think so. They think it's extremely think important it's sexy, and sexy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. To my human eyes, it's like, what are you doing? You've got a void <laughs> and then some blue pinpricks of light. And scientists have tried to mimic the structural color of a variety of animals, including certain butterfly wings, uh, extracting blackness from them. So we could probably learn a thing or two about these tail feathers that could give telescopes or other optical engineering feats a boost. It's also cool that it's not about, you can coat it with gold and it's still black because it's not about the color that the Mm -hmm. substance itself is. There's a, there's something, there's like an an effect on photons (laughs) where Mm -hmm. they can't get out. And that's why it looks black. That's cool. Well, you guys are tied too. So now I really have to pick. So I have to think about well, they're and they both make good TikToks. Sari, can you find me a picture of the gold feather next to the not gold feather, but that both have been sprayed with gold? I can find you pictures of butterflies. <laughs> I know they are <laughs> good. Butterflies are good. <laughs> I mean, there's one in this paper, but uh, I don't know if you uh, you can use whatever you want on TikTok. I don't know how. how <laughs> yeah, I don't have yes. a rights Bible. I own. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. That little carbon, that little electron microscope image too. That's freaking dope. All right, Sarah, congratulations on your win. Ah, damn it. <laughs> and now it's time to ask the science couch where we have a listener question for our couch of finely honed scientific minds. Ariandia on Discord and at Alexandre on Twitter asked, why did we lose our tails? I'm sad I don't have one. 
<laughs> Are you sad th- you don't have one too? I think I am sad I don't have one, but I I don't know. I f- it might be really gross too. I think I'd only want one if everybody had one. Not to be yeah, a totally. conformist. But yeah. I don't like if I had like a really awesome prehensile tail and it was super useful, I kind of still wouldn't want one if I yeah. was the only one. <laughs> um <laughs> Can can I say on um, something that is not an answer to the question? Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think that it will be pretty easy it, if we want to to give people tails in the future. Robot or organic tails? Organic tails, we just don't... like you know, yeah. yeah. Germline engineering. You gotta like just change change the change the genes. I bet I bet it won't be hard to unlock the tail. I bet it's all it's still in there. People are going to want Tales too if Avatar 2's box office is anything to go off of. <laughs> you know? <laughs> James I don't think Cameron our tales... is really like paying you for that <laughs> placement there. I don't, wow. I don't think that our Tales will be as um, elegant or multifunctional as the uh, Avatar <laughs> Tales, though, unfortunately. That's sad. Well, yeah, I don't actually know wh- why Tales were enough of a disadvantage. Was it have to do with bipedalism? No, like chimps don't really have tails. They have like a little thing, don't they? Do we just get too big? Because like gorillas don't have tails. So maybe there's a certain size. I think they have nubs as well. No, I think uh, gray apes, which I think a gorilla is one of, has similar genetic mutations as us. Okay. That do not have tails. So the the rationale behind it is still up in the air. Why, Why there are monkeys with tails and great apes without tails why that split happened and why it was evolutionary advantageous enough. Mm -hmm. We're not sure. A lot of people point to bipedalism or just general mobility, a tail. While it can be helpful, it can also get in the way. Um, Some people, there are like a couple small theories out there that may have to do with like aggression. So as great apes get bigger, then the tail becomes another thing you can like yank on or, Mm -hmm. or get at. If in conflict. That happens in um, Avatar so- too. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. See, they... <laughs> <laughs> they should have learned. <laughs> they showed us what our, our current uh, state of being could be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but what is interesting to me, and I don't think was really substantiated until recently like in until 2021 in around september when a paper was published um the tail disappeared quite fast in evolutionary Mm. history Mm. it was probably just one main mutation that switched from having a tail to not having a tail so your unrelated thing is actually very related because we could probably switch back to having a tail if we could like get in there and change this this gene mutation so my my so, sense was correct. Yes, it, more correct than maybe you even knew. Um, <laughs> where <laughs> there is a gene called TBXT. This is getting into more intense genetics, so the names are all all yeah. mushy and not as fun as mm-hmm. Sonic the Hedgehog or whatnot. <laughs> um, and there are there's basically a short DNA insertion called an ALU element. There are a bunch of them throughout our genome. A lot of them are just nonsense. There's a lot of junk DNA throughout the genome. But if you have a sequence, like an ALU sequence and then a reverse sequence, kind of like two magnets on a string, it'll like stick together and then mess with the translation and transcription of that one part of the gene. And so what happened was there was an insertion, an ALU insertion that messed up our TBXT gene which is related to tail development. Do we know if this is related to when people do have tails? Because sometimes people do have tails. I don't think it is related to that. Okay. From what That's I like can a tell. things going on. So human embryos do sometimes develop in utero around like five or six weeks. So really, really small still. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a tail with a couple vertebra in it but then it disappears by like eight weeks. So it's some, the the weird nebulous processing of human development, it happens there. But mm-hmm. most tails that develop through birth are pseudo tails. They're some sort of like teratomas, which I think we've talked gotcha. about before, okay. which is just like a cancerous mass of cells. Um, and so there's like sometimes muscle and uh, cardiovascular and other tissue in that. Um, 
And I think it's just because of a, a concentration of stem cells around the spinal area, but mm-hmm. it is not a true tail. Gotcha. Um, they're, they're not innervated with the spine in that way. They're just kind of okay. like a flesh, a mm. fleshy mass. Um, from what I could find in papers about it. That makes sense. And I like the idea that we lost our tails because we kept yanking on them. It was just like, <laughs> oh, that's too inconvenient. <laughs> we gotta get rid of these things. To have a like handhold that's only good for hurting a person. Yeah. We were too mean. Yeah, we were too mean. But the Avatar people tails. couldn't get rid of it because it does all that stuff. It's got a bunch of rolls. <sighs> that's their ponytails. That's not their tail. Their tail. That's a different thing, Hank. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there was that sigh again. There was that sigh again. I don't know if I should admit that I know this intimate detail about the avatar. I thought it was their butt tails that they no. kissed with. No, it's oh. their head, head tentacles. <laughs> Faith is super disappointed right now, or possibly just embarrassed for her own sake. If you want to ask the science couch a question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we'll tweet out topics for upcoming episodes every week, or you can join our Patreon and ask us on our Discord, uh, where we may or may not be panicking on it. Thank you to at Raccoon Required <laughs> Jose Gallegos on YouTube and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. If you like the show and you want to help us out, it's very easy to do that. You can go to patreon.com slash SciShow Tangents, become a patron, get access to things like our newsletter and our bonus episodes. A special thank you to patrons John Pollock and Les Aker. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That helps us know what you like about the show and it helps other people find us. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell people tell about people us. Tell people about us. I'm serious. You got to tell people about us. And also, you can, you can tell them to check out our YouTube because that's there. YouTube.com slash SciShow Tangents. And then that we're also a podcast. You can see our faces and we'll also sometimes post little pictures. Every Tuesday we do a premiere over on YouTube and, and I'm hanging out chatting. Sometimes Hank drops it's true. in. Yeah, and we do little polls so you can participate. Mm-hmm. And this one, maybe you will have done the poll on... If you poop on your own head or not. <laughs> if you poop, if you poop, on, poop your on your own head, head or not. <laughs> <laughs> a really really fun poll <laughs> thank you for joining us I've been Hank Green I've been Sari Riley and I've been Sam Schultz SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz our associate producer is Faith Schmidt our editor is Seth Glicksman our story editor is Alex Billow our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bazayo our editorial assistant is Deboki Chakravarty the sound design is by Joseph Tunamedish our executive producers are Kaylin Hoffmeister and me Hank Green and we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you, and remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But, one more thing. Technically, arthropod tails are the rearmost segment of their body called the metasoma, which includes classic butt anatomy like the anus or the ovipositor in certain species. Yeah. And one of yeah. the most elaborate insect tails belongs to the wasp C. caramba, named after the Spanish exclamation, I caramba, because it was found <laughs> in the University Museum Collection in Lima, Peru, and surprised Finnish researchers with its weirdness. Specifically, <laughs> this wasp has a super long metasoma ending in a dark colored mass that looks scarily like an ant head with antenna, hmm. possibly to scare away spider predators or lure in prey. Uh, either way, it has a butt head. Very surprising. Enough to say, I caramba. Like Bart would say. Bart discovered it, actually. They <laughs> yeah, probably hid, the, hid their yeah, identity. Was... <laughs> <laughs> he, grew up. he turned his life around and got into science, but he couldn't, couldn't keep that one part of him at bay. The part that says I caramba. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs>